Today we'll finish the language and education chapter in Warta and Fuller, and uh, we'll, we'll start from, we actually started to talk about this all, already last time, the differences in cultures and how that affects how, how students will do in class. Uh, one of, one of like classic studies was done by Shirley Bryce Heath in the early uh, 1980s. And what she studied is basically three different communities. And she, uh, she found that these three different communities had radically different ways of dealing with literacy. She was interested in, in uh, what kinds of literacy skills children bring into, into school and how their literacy skills then affect how they do in school and uh, how, they, uh, how their culture is kind of understood by the teachers. Um, some of you are, are planning to become teachers, so I think this is an important uh, chapter, perhaps the most important in the entire book because uh, because it reminds us of some of the issues behind why some children do not do well in school and why some children are likely to do better. And of course, uh, if this is something that can be can be fixed, there is no easy fix for for those kinds of things. But if the teachers understand that students come from different backgrounds, not only uh, from maybe speaking a different dialect than the standard, but sometimes speaking, and very often, uh, speaking a completely different language, then, uh, then we kind of like understand that w what, what, we want to, what we want to accomplish. Of course, what we want to accomplish in schools is based on ideologies. Do we want everybody to adopt standard uh, American English, or do we want to provide standard American English as a, a second dialect, a second language, second dialect for students who come from different language backgrounds, different dialect backgrounds, and uh, and of course, you know, in in earlier times, linguists have been preaching this equality of all different dialects and all different languages now for four decades already. Uh, and I think this is making a difference, but still, uh, still, if you want to be a teacher, you kind of want to keep this in, in mind when you have those students who speak a, a variety of English or no English when they come to your, your uh, classroom. So what is it that you want to accomplish? Uh, one thing that linguists have been preaching is that we don't want to wipe away the, uh, the student's home language or home dialect because, uh, because language is such an inter inter integral part of who we are that if we, if we wipe out or, or not appreciate, send a subtle message that we don't appreciate the way a student speaks, then that means that we don't appreciate that student's family and the language that is spoken in the student's home, in his, in his community, uh, family typically. And, uh, and it's, it's a horrible message to send and I have often made this made this parallel with how a student dresses, how, how a student speaks. So if you say to a student, I don't like the way you dress, and I know this is going on also in, in schools, um, and uh, they have all kinds of dress codes and so on. So, so then there would be this other code about how to how to speak. Now this is with the, with the social justice movement, this uh, issue, because for a long time it was, it was uh, fine for linguists to say that we want students to become bidialectal or multidialectal and bilingual if not multilingual. And, uh, and nowadays uh, people say we can't just, you know, promote standard English in, in any way. Um, 
I don't think that that's a realistic solution, um, but you know, shoot me if you don't <laughs> believe in that. But I, I do wanna, wanna say that we have to be also realistic here, that we live in the so-called what is a fallen world <laughs> where even though no matter how much we say that everybody's dialect is equal, everybody's language is equal, depending on where you are, um, the, the covert prestige that we have been talking about, it doesn't reach to all places. And some doors may be closed if we don't, if children don't uh, learn uh, the standard rules to an extent or English to an extent and so you know you cannot do certain things in for instance in the USA if you do not know the rules of standard English it's unfair it's totally unfair because if we if we think about how standard American English became standard American English it was the dialect it was somebody's dialect and it was the dialect of those who, who could afford to have education. And then they were the ones who wrote the dictionaries and grammar books, and they tended to be white men. Even women didn't have the chance of going to, going to school. So I have sometimes, uh, sometimes mentioned this as, a, as an alternative reality. So, uh, so we had slaves here in the USA, and, uh, and uh, if instead of sending a group of slaves to, to the fields, uh, they had been sent to Harvard University to study English, and uh, their task would have been to write dictionaries and grammar books. We would have a different kind of standard, right? And, uh, and uh, the, in, in your book, uh, Wardhill and Fuller, they uh, remind about the same thing, not quite as dramatically, but, but, uh, but for instance, if the London dialect in England had not become the standardized dialect, if, uh, if some other place in England like York would have been uh, the place of prestige whose dialect would have then looked at, looked upon as standard, uh, standard and that would have been imposed on everybody. Uh, now everybody in the world, because our American English is based on the London standard that developed gradually because London was such an important place, um, we would have a totally different standard. Not totally, because it's still the same language, but we would have we would have you know different different pronunciations, different morphosyntax, and so on. So uh, so what the what becomes chosen as the standard is uh, arbitrary in a way. It's not like okay, whose standard are we going to be uh, appointing? But it, it it's a consequence of these people having the opportunity to go to school and uh, and uh, study and then uh, provide the rules for everybody else so uh, so it's complicated but but this is this is where we live uh, this world where <clears throat> where no matter how much linguists preach the equality of all the dialects and all the languages we still are in a situation where the great masses of people don't understand it. Uh, you know, you hear comments, oh, he doesn't even speak English, that's really bad English, that's, that's not uh, good English. And these value judgments, like, you know, prescriptive uh, judgment of language, and, um, and it, it, it's, it's difficult to get over that. Of course, you know, we can continue preaching and, and the more students we teach, and the students go out and they say to their relatives who may sometimes say, oh, that's such bad English, then, then you know, you can say, no, it's actually appropriate for that particular situation. <laughs> and, uh, and that way the word kind of gets around. But, um, 
at, at some point, uh, some point, uh, some particular variety is probably going to be chosen, or has has it has been chosen, needs to be kept in order for, like for instance, writing to happen, academic writing, publishing, and so on, and keeping in mind that language changes, it picks up features from other varieties, and that, like we pointed out earlier, that in today's variation of language, we have the seeds of language change in the future. So somebody's variety is a good one <laughs> to uh, kind of like pass on, and good I mean in, in quotation marks, absolutely, because I'm a linguist. And uh, I look at things from, you know, from non-prescriptive point of view. Yes. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, something that I've noticed with like English in particular is like the sentiment that English native English speakers have towards non-native English speakers. Like I feel like the people that I've met like here, um, they kind of be like, "Oh, why come live in America if you don't speak English?" But at the same time, they're like, oh, I never really learned how to speak this language until I visited this country. And I'm like, oh, well, you're isn't kind of it a, Isn't it a, an amazing paradox? Yeah. Yes, right. And of course, there have been these movements, the English-only movement, the official English movement, that we should make English the official language, because all these immigrants are pouring in, and they will take over English. Well, I have news for those people. English is not an endangered language in America, uh, in the world, because it's, I mean, it's a world language. Everybody, there is no single immigrant who comes to this country who does not want to learn English. Uh, it's just very hard when you are, when you are, if you are older, if you are an adult already, because language acquisition is harder for adults, that's a fact. Um, if you are uh, in a situation where every waking hour you are working in order to bring food for your family, you don't have time for ESL courses in the evening, time or energy, so it's it's very, in a way unfair to say all oh, these people don't want to learn English. Everybody wants to learn English. Yeah. So, um, so it, it's... It's it, also kind of hard when like you're trying to learn like a foreign language in a country and all of the people that live in that country are like, no, nah, I don't want to help you. You're like a, an alien or whatever. And then it's just, it, it goes along with the racism thing. Like they just don't yeah. want to like, they, they don't really like correct if someone messes up in English, they're like, oh, you don't speak English, like, kind of get away from me. Instead of being like, oh, you said that wrong, this is how you say it, and, like, teaching them. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Sorry, I just went on a rant. It really pisses me off. <laughs> of course, yes, <laughs> me too. <laughs> so, um, if, if, so we, we'll probably come back to these topics uh, later on, but first I want to kind of like lift up Shirley Bryce Heath's early 1980s article where she looked at Main Town, Roadville and Tracton. These are all like in America, in, uh, in, uh, in a southern, they are imaginary towns based on real towns, so the names are pseudonyms. Um, and Main Town uh, is uh, the, the people whom, uh, sh whose language Br uh, Shirley Bryce Heath looked at were a group of people from these different backgrounds. So Main Town is a white middle class neighborhood and uh, she recruited a lot of, a lot of teachers for her, for her um, you know, that was a network for her study. And, uh, and got permission to record and observe um, interactions in, in these people's homes. So white middle class, a lot of teacher mothers, uh, Roadville, another white neighborhood, 
but it was an industrial neighborhood where uh, uh, it was more. So if M Main Town was middle class, Roadville was working class. And then Tracton is a black farming community. So we have another demographic here. So three different demographics. And, uh, and we can probably already guess, even without looking at or talking about Heath's findings, that children from which community did best in school? Main town, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, and because the children's language and literacy skills already when they went to school, they matched with the literacy skills that were expected from students. So all of these, uh, the main town children, they were. Um, they were brought basically, and I may exaggerate, but they were brought home from the hospital after they were, they were born. They were brought into a nursery which had a nice theme of Winnie the Pooh or, <laughs> or something, some other literary character. So they already had this, had this, you know, in, in, the, in the images and everything uh, around them. And these children are, taught, are, are read bedtime stories. Uh, and not only read bedtime stories, but there is this discussion after the bedtime story. By the way, one of Heath's articles was what not bedtime story mean, what no bedtime story means. So, um, so uh, the children, heard literary pieces, you know, appropriate, age appropriate, and then they had these discussions, not only questions like, what is this, but also, also, I mean, of course, that's where you start with a very young child labeling, what is that, that's a, that's a dog, what is this, this is a pig, and, and, and those kinds of labels. But then, uh, then discussions about the pictures, for instance, about the stories, like why do you think that the, the piglet is crying? So why questions come relatively early in Main Town, this metaphorical place of Main Town? And uh, so not only what and who questions, but why and how questions, which are cognitively more demanding, and uh, the children learn to think about these things. So, why, why did, uh, why does, why does this kitty look sad? And then you try to think about this. So make these connections, and and you see consequences of other people's actions, and and so on. So, uh, so that's uh, how uh, the main town children were kind of like they were, they were being coached for school. Their parents also spoke a variety of English that was closer to standard English, middle class dialects, and therefore they were kind of, when they went to school, their literacy, literacy experiences and their language, they matched more with the teachers. And teachers, by definition, are middle class. So, um, so then uh, in Roadville, this was the white industrial community, white lower class, not necessarily industrial, but not, not, main, not middle class. Um, in Roadville, in, the, in these white households, children were also read bedtime stories. But they had more of those kind of like books were more like toys. And uh, and like you know those edible books <laughs> that you know you can chew on them and and uh, and 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 touch the pictures and there's a soft lamb and then there's a spiky uh, hedgehog or something you know the kinds of books that I so so those were um, so the book was kind of like a toy at the same time. 
And, uh, but these, these children in Roadville, they were introduced to literacy and they were read these bedtime stories and uh, their parents also asked questions after the stories or interacted with the children. But the questions differed slightly from the main town questions so that there was more labeling like what is this and who is this and what is the name of this uh, character and so on. So, who and what questions, whereas in Maine Town the questions went to the cognitively more difficult questions like why and how. In interesting, interesting finding. So when the Roadville children go to school, uh, they are already, because in the first grades, in the initial stages of schooling, uh, what what you do in classrooms, you very often do the labeling kind of thing. What is this? What's the name of this? So who and what? So those kinds, kinds of questions. The Road, Roadville children were ready for entering school because they had been all also um, co coached in order to answer those kinds, kinds of questions about the books. Now, later on, <coughs> when uh, when you enter upper grades, then the how and why questions become Im important. And I'm just using this as like, you know, the more advanced literary, uh, literary skills. And that's where the road, Roadville children were not ready because they had not been practicing then. But at least they had not been like snubbed in the very beginning of the school. Uh, their school career uh, that they don't know how to discuss literacy because they had they had had books in their homes. The Trapton children came from a very different kind of background. Uh, what he found, and this, these are all these are all kind of like stereotyped uh, generalizations. But sometimes we need a stereotyped generalization to make a point, and I think her point was really good, that children come from these different backgrounds. In Trapton, the children didn't, the, the homes did not have books for the children to look at, and they were not uh, read to the children as bedtime stories, like in Maine Town and Roadville. This was a, a relatively poor black farming community. And uh, this doesn't mean that the children did not learn literacy skills. On the contrary, they learned a lot of oral literacy skills. They learned storytelling. What is a good story? What makes a good story? Now, if you, if you go back and think about especially a white middle class home, the children are are asked all these all these questions like why don't you tell tell what happened today like I mentioned last time tell what happened today uh, at kindergarten and tell dad what you did and tell tell uncle where we went this uh, this afternoon and what happened in the park and and they are like in it, 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 they are like expected and encouraged to tell these little stories so that they learn to tell factual stories. We looked at Mindy's and Leona's stories and how different they were last time. Uh, Mindy the little white girl and, and Leona the little black girl and they told totally different stories. So, um, <coughs> so uh, children are, these white kids are, are taught in their homes, and I'm again, I'm. Uh, this is not in every white household, and and it, 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 you know you don't have to be white in order to be middle class, obviously. But uh, but Heath wanted to make a point, and in the 1980s, that was a really important point still to make. So uh, so these children, they learn different kinds of literacy skills, and in Tracton, uh, the children. They are not read books, but they are told stories, and they hear these stories. Now, these children are encouraged to tell stories, 
and what adults tend to do, a little toddler toddles there and adults are speaking and the toddler starts speaking and everybody stops and turns around, oh, what do you have to say? Oh, that's really neat. And so children are I I encouraged even to, of course, we hear the adults are speaking now. You need to wait. We hear that too. But, uh, but uh, all in all, uh, children are so thrilled if a child wants to talk that they pay attention to that child. What, what he found in Tracton is that the, the kid had to have a really good story in order for everybody to stop, stop and listen to the child. So what the children learned at the age of four and five and so on, they learned to tell a good story. I'm going to tell a good story just like uncle, just like my aunt, just like my dad, just like my mom, just like my grandmother, and then I will get the attention. And so the, the reward was if they told a good story. And now, Min, not Mindy's, but Leona's story that we looked at last time, Leona's story was that kind of a good story. It was a fantastic story because it had like, you know, these connections to classical literature that, you know, you do something you're not supposed to do and you become like a, like a non-human animal. Like she started, grandmother started growling like a dog and because she ate too many cupcakes and she ate cupcakes that we didn't make. So, uh, so this kind of family unity thing was violated and there were consequences for grandmother becoming sick and like a dog. And, uh, and that was a fantastic story. So Trapton children, they learn to tell these wonderful, vivid, colorful, uh, pointed stories that are oral literature. And, uh, and uh, when they go to school, that's not what is expected from them because their literacy, literacy skills are in a way more advanced than what is expected in the lower grades. And it doesn't match the expectations because you're supposed to be doing very simple labeling. Like, what is this? What is going on? Who is this? What is the name of this little piglet? So, so uh, they are not used to that. And if you remember the two Bernstein, Basil Bernstein stories about elaborated versus restricted quotes, um, why would you, why would you, if you already know that the name of this little pig is Piglet, why would that even be like, you know, brought up? Uh, because it's kind of too obvious. So uh, the Tracton children don't get, don't get, um, the kind of training to start from the beginning of uh, that that Maintown and Rockville kids do. Their skills would be needed in upper grades when you have to do creative writing, when you write compositions. Uh, those, the skills that a Tracton child has would come really handy then. But the sad thing is that by that they haven't been noticed, and their, uh, their um, skills have not been encouraged uh, because like what happened to, happened to Leona, for instance, in that uh, G uh, or, uh, article from, it, the, the, the stories came from uh, Paul G's um, article, and uh, what, what he, he says is that even the fact that Leona got to tell her fantastic story was because the real teacher was out of classroom and and sh and the, the substitute didn't or, or the teaching aide didn't interrupt her like now Leona do you really know how many you know cookies there were or how many cupcakes there were uh, because facts are uh, facts are uh, especially in Roadville. Uh, in the working class white community. Facts are uh, underscored. You know, don't lie, be factual, especially, I guess, in the Bible Belt. 
even more so because you know you don't tell lies so don't be creative because that's based on lies <laughs> right so uh, anyway what um, what her uh, her research showed that how can these children the only group that can continue to do well throughout school from K through 12 are the main town children because not only do they speak a language variety that is closer to the teachers and standard but they also have been trained to the kinds of literary skills that are expected in school. Does that make any sense? Uh, it makes sense, but like, are there like, this is just like general blanket statement, like someone from like upper middle class could still like, you know, not have those skills? Upper, upper? Like, like in Maine Town, like would there be like a family there that like, you know, the child didn't really have those skills? Um, probably, yes, because I mean this is, as I said, like, you know, stereotyped generalizations for the uh, goal of making, making a point that children come from different backgrounds, or may come from different if you take any individual family, Heath's generalizations probably don't all apply. So, uh, so it's 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 good to keep in mind that we have this have this. So, what what she was looking at was the intersection of race and social class, um, and of course, as we've talked. Uh, throughout this, this uh, particular class, we've talked about the fact that those don't, it's, it, it's, social class is probably more, has more explanatory power than race. Yeah. Or ethnicity. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But, uh, but it was, uh, it, it, it became a classic, uh, and I remember when I first read this, I'm like, wow, this really puts, even though it is, in a sense, fictional, these are fictional towns based on real family uh, interactions that he's dead and had, she was involved in all these, but, um, but it's still, you know, what she put together is um, for the purpose of generalization. In the same way as the Bernstein examples of uh, the retellings of the of the cartoon strip uh, where were like aggregates from many many different stories so no one story was exemplified by that story but like generalizations from many different stories so uh, so and and of course I mean this these kinds of studies lend themselves for criticism because they are not quantitative, they are more qualitative, and but their goals are a little bit different. So uh, anyway, okay, so we are in a situation that all these kids go to school, so who, who, what is, what, who should adapt? This is the uh, exploration 13.1 that I wanted you to look over. And um, is it the is it the families? Is it the children? Is it the school system that should adapt? I feel like who like if nothing was like changed from like what it should be, I feel like the Tracton kids would have to adapt because I feel like the Roseville and the Main Town wouldn't really have to uh, based on how things are currently. Yeah. But I think that like the school system should adapt to the children, if that makes any sense. Yes, uh, y yes, it does, because this is, the school system is there to embrace everybody. Yeah. At least in theory, it should. Yeah, in theory, not in practice. <laughs> exactly, right, yes. And um, 
absolutely. So, uh, and also these are people, teachers are people who have the skills to understand and adapt. It, it's more work. Uh, but you know, if we just teach, like if we just teach for the main town kids, because that's the easiest thing, because they already know how to do this, so my job is easier. Uh, that's not the route to take. But then, of course, the other thing is that if you teach to the average student, then what's going to happen to the main town kids? Do they not reach their full potential? And are the Tracton kids still left out? So, uh, so it, the 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 challenge is that every teacher faces are really huge in the actual situation, speech situation. Then, I mean, we, there were these, all these experiments that lasted for years and years that you separated the children so that you put the advanced children in advanced classes, and that's still going on. There are AB classes, and, uh, and then there are the, what is that? Um, uh, there's on level. On um, level, yes. And then there's AP, pre AP, and dual credit. Yes. And then there's like special ed classes. They don't really have like a remedial class, which is kind of like if you're not on level, then you're like in special ed. Exactly, yes. Yes, and that was so, so interesting to me. and. When, I, when we moved into, into this country, I really did not know that there are these different, different levels and tracks in, in school, like for instance in English. Oh, I didn't pay attention to it because I, I had like my full trust in the school system. And um, it, it, and I'll tell a little story, which is kind of like um, illuminating. Um, so we are an immigrant family in California, and my son was uh, was put into into a remedial English class based on the fact that he had a really weird name <laughs> from the American point of view and was clearly uh, an immigrant child. So I, I, I was just like, I didn't even pay attention to what that, you know, I didn't know that there are these different levels of English classes until there was a, a PTA evening and, uh, and we went to the, as parents, we went to his classroom and it turns out that we're the only ones there. And, uh, and the teacher is, uh, literally, he was sitting on the desk and very casual and he's like, oh, this is just a kickback English class and we basically do puzzle, puzz puzzles here. We don't, we don't pay, m we pay, we, we don't pay. We don't do much of that creative. We don't do any of that creative writing stuff, and we we study the common rules and punctuation rules, other punctuation rules, and and then we do puzzles. And I'm listening to that, and I'm like, what? My son is in a class where they just do puzzles in the English class, or uh, or you know crossword puzzles, or whatever. And I called to the school the following morning and I said, could you please explain to me what a kickback English class means? And, and they said, oh, did the teacher actually say that? And I'm like, yeah, I, and I'm interested in knowing what it means. And I thought maybe this is some kind of a, an educational term, but I had figured out that yes, it is a, an educational term. And uh, they, they said, we are going to move your son from that class to, uh, to an on-level, uh, class level. What did you say? What is the term? Uh, on-level is just like regular. The regular. Yeah. So we're going to be moving him to, to a class where he 
learns more in English. And uh, because I asked, and I present that uh, that uh, option or this outcome to my son, and I said. Guess what? You're going to be moved to a higher level English class so that you know you can learn. He said, "I don't want to move." <laughs> he refused. He refused to move. He he was happy in you know doing the with the low expectations. And sometimes I, I mean, he 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 went and he, and did did fine. It, despite this one year experience in a kickback English class, and he knows his punctuation rules pretty well, so something good came out of it. But he is not a, much of a creative writer. He doesn't even read much of you know creative stuff. So anyway, um, it's those are the kinds of things, and I am a, I am a, I mean I I I'm a teacher myself. I taught in a high school for, for years before immigrating and I was in you know doctoral program I was learning about these kinds of things sociolinguistics and so on yet when it came to my own kids I didn't have the wherewithal to understand that in this culture you really have to be watching into what kinds of classes your kid goes into I was better with the two of my younger children, and um, and uh, they they found themselves in you know some of the AP classes and and so on. But uh, but anyway, uh, then I thought, okay, you are a teacher yourself, albeit in a different country, but you are an educated person. What about the workers who come here with with like the low skill workers who come here work minimum wage and their children go to school how do they even manage this situation they may not even be speaking english and it so it is such a such a challenge and what i learned is i learned i you, you can't trust the school system completely you have to be knowledgeable about what is going on and ask questions and so on. I tended to, you know, I, I, I kind of found it obnoxious for me to even call and ask, what is this kickback English class? But it was a good thing for me that I, I understood now, okay, he's in this class this year and next year he's in a different school. So yeah, he ended up graduating from ESL and, and doing pretty well in in the rest of his school years, but um, actually very well, <laughs> but especially in math, which doesn't require creative language skills. <laughs> but um, so this who should adapt question is it's a really tricky one because if we have these tracks, that's an attempt to to take into consideration children's different backgrounds, but not so that you don't teach the higher level skills also to those who are not at the level quite yet. Okay, so um, African American uh, vernacular English and the Oakland School District um, debate which happened in mid-1990s. Um, Oakland, California is a school district where at that point about 80% of the, of the students in that school district came from low-income uh, African-American families. And uh, what the Oakland school district decided to do, they knew that, okay, these this children, they speak a, a variety of English, a dialect of English that is uh, quite different in some respects from standard English and what are we going to do in order to cater to the needs of these children. What they came up with, and your book doesn't mention this, but, uh, but I do want to add this, they, they said, oh, we want to teach Ebonics, and it was called Ebonics, that was the, you know, fashionable term 
to refer to African American vernacular English at that point, which kind of like takes the African it believes we talked about the different uh, theories about how African American vernacular English came to be, how it is today, and we had these, you know, the Afrocentric view, the Eurocentric view, um, and the Creole uh, Creolist view, and uh, the uh, ebonic, ebonics uh, term users tend to believe if tend to believe that this is the Afrocentric view. It's uh, ebonics is. African American vernacular English is the way it is because <coughs> it carries the traces of the African languages. So, and we talked about that. You know, all the, all the three proposals, main proposals, probably are true, and not one of these uh, proposals can be like say, okay, this is the true thing. But anyway, so what the Oakland School District uh, decided, the administrators there, the board, decided to do, okay, uh, let's call Ebonics a different language, just like, you know, Spanish would be, or Vietnamese, or German, or whatever, so let's call Ebonics a different language. And that way they were able to tap the bilingual, uh, bilingual teaching funds for what they were doing there. So, uh, so it was a kind of a Machiavellian way of approaching this situation that, okay, if we call it a different language, then we can get these, these funds from bilingual education. And uh, I mean, that's not, that's what you, what you do if you, if you want, to, want to get funding, sometimes uh, present things in a certain light. But linguistically, of course, African American is not a different language. We can understand African American, African American speakers can understand standard. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's no different from, like, you know, a white working class uh, uh, dialect or Scottish. English or what have you, which you know, you kind of have to pay attention sometimes a little bit more in order to catch every single single uh, phrase. But the, the more you are around with speakers of different dialects, the easier it becomes to understand. And uh, and uh, yet we have to see that for the little African American vernacular speakers who come to school, they have, they may have difficulty understanding the white middle class teachers or black middle class teachers uh, or whatever the, the teacher's uh, ethnicity is. So it, it is a different dialect, yes, but this is a different language linguistically, no, because it's a variety of English. So anyway, what this, this whole thing became very famous. It was in the news, there were programs in the radio and TV about teaching Ebonics in Oakland, California. And, uh, and people were opposed to the, the, I, the whole idea that now we are now we are teaching a non-standard variety of English in schools, and uh, of course that was not the that was not the the goal. Uh, the the underlying goal. The underlying goal is to do something so that the African American children will not be left behind in schools because of the fact that the teacher speaks standard English or something closer to standard English. Yes? So, uh, African American vernacular English used to be called Ebonics, right? Yes. So, do you think that they're gonna change the name again? Because I think that it's like a, I'm not entirely sure, I don't, I'm white, so I can't really say anything about it. Like, I can't have like a solid opinion. I don't wanna put like words into other races' mouths, but I've like heard from black people that they don't really appreciate being called African American because their uh, history, like their ancestry and stuff was like wiped out. 
Um, so they don't really know exactly where they came from. Mm -hmm. Do you think it might change again? To start using. It would be like the same thing, but do you think the name would change again? Like the I teacher? I don't know. I I think it's um, it's it has been used synonymously for African American vernacular, and African American vernacular English has been changing. It's you know it has been referred to by by very different. You pick up a linguistics book from the 1970s. It's referred to as. BVE Black Vernacular English. Um, if you go, if you pick up a linguistics book from the 1940s, it was called Negro English, and that did not have the, you know, the the negative connotations as the N word has. So it was just like this is what we call it. This is then then we called it Black English. Then we called it African American Vernacular English. And people are struggling to. Find and then some people. Okay, let's call it ebonics, um, but that seems seems to have different connotations, and it's it's difficult to refer to something that many people would not even like to refer to at all, because we've, if we if we if we are totally like color blind which we should be, then you wouldn't be calling different varieties of English with different names. But, uh, but that's not the only variety of English for just because we need, the fact is that many African Americans use a lot of the features of the African American vernacular English. And, uh, and at the same time, like we talked about earlier, that uh, variety shares an awful lot with, uh, with southern working class dialects. The, the use of ain't and double negations are not reserved for the speakers of black English or African American vernacular. Uh, Anyone can use that, and anyone does. A lot of, you know, working class dialects use those as well. And as I've said, double, triple negations were grammatical in old English. <laughs> so, so you know, everything is kind of like a, a particular feature. Uh, attaching it with a particular ethnicity is is not how things should be. At the same time, um, we do want to, we can't just, you know, okay, this, this, this variety doesn't exist. Uh, that wouldn't be helpful either. So what the Oakland uh, uh, school district decided to do, let's kind of like talk about, the, uh, talk about it and not talk around it. And let's do this, let's try to uh, make children raise their awareness that there are different dialects of English and their way of, the children's way of speaking may be different from the teacher's way of speaking. Now let's look at how and what is an appropriate place for, for the teacher's way of speaking, for instance, and, uh, and what is, and, and you, the appropriate, uh, outlet for African American vernacular is of course within your family. If it's your family dialect, then that's where you, you use it and also elsewhere. But there are these very tiny restricted areas like academic writing where, where we are teaching you a different dialect, right? And I, I saw a very good film. Uh, it was during a linguistics um, uh, the Society of America conference, which is referred to here in the book, and they they were uh, this ebonics discussion was really a hot topic then, and um, so I saw this really interesting film about second graders. The teacher was also African American, and uh, and fluent in you know 
standard English and African American vernacular and of course these are not separate entities, it's a continuum like every dialect is. And what, what that film showed was a, a clip from, from his classroom where he asks these second graders like now tell a story and uh, put that story on a, at that time, the, the transparencies and overhead projectors were used to write your story on little story, of course, these are short stories, these are second graders. So the little second graders wrote their stories on the transparencies and they came to present them to the entire class and they read the presentation, everybody is clapping, they get a lot of positive attention, and positive feedback. And then after that is done, the teacher said, that that's a great story. Now, how, what, do we, what do we need to change in order to make this into a written, written story? It's a great spoken story. How do we make it into a written story? And then so the little hands go up and somebody says, get rid of no there and, you know, double negation. And of course they didn't use the terms, but th they saw immediately that there, there is a double negation used in that little story. And add, a, add a, an, a, a, an is there, like, you know, if the ch a child had written um, dog, um, dog fluffy, uh, ad dog is fluffy and so these are african-american little kids and they see these differences and then the little boy makes those revisions there on that on that story and so so the purpose was to raise awareness that there are these different dialects and we can tell the same story orally in African American vernacular, and then when we put it in more academic form, then we change it to this unfortunately superimposed dialect, the standard English, which um, people still probably benefit from learning. A totally uh, exact, more uh, exaggerated situation is when when uh, in, in multilingual education, when children come from uh, immigrant backgrounds and don't speak English when they go to school. And here I have a story too. When my seven-year-old went to first grade in California, when we first moved here, um, it was in late September, I received this call from um, a local hospital. Uh, and they say, Mrs. Honori, your child has a serious speech impediment. I'm like, okay, um, and she doesn't speak. And I started kind of laughing and I said, did it occur to anyone to ask to find out before you tested her speech like you do, like, you know, regularly, that was a private, private school. And, uh, and that, you know, she just moved here like a month ago, so she doesn't speak English. <laughs> she speaks plenty in Finnish. But, uh, I mean, she's seven, she's shy. They did this test, they said, what is that, what is that? And she's just sitting there, not saying anything. And I didn't even, you know, know that they had done that test, but then I said, well, I, I don't think speech therapy is needed in, in her case. Time is needed. And, and of course, you know, by Christmas, she was a little chatterbox in English, at which point I had to start worrying about her losing her native language completely. So we, we have these uh, notions, elite bilingualism and immigrant bilingualism, and again, I sometimes feel that, you know, <laughs> kind of like, you know, my kids are immigrants, but they came from a, from a background that, you know, I'm doing a PhD in linguistics. So it was, an, in, in that sense, also elite uh, background. So separating these totally is, is not working, but the basic, basic uh, point is that 
immigrant bilingualism if, if it's also overlapping with uh, with uh, the um, like you know lower so socioeconomic backgrounds. It is a very difficult situation because the parents are working hard to fulfill the needs, the financial needs of the family, food on the table, that's the goal number one. And they don't, if they don't speak English, for instance, then they don't have, they cannot help the children in, in school. Lower grades, immigrant children can do well um, because the cognitive skills needed uh, are uh, their cognitive skills are age appropriate, but their language, English language expectations are not cognitively high yet. Then you, could, then you put a, an immigrant child into a junior high, uh, high school where you're talking about much more difficult concepts already. And if you don't know English, then you, your skills are it's 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 much higher they have higher risk of being behind so okay those are difficult difficult topics i don't think i have the answers to everything but if we if we know if we are you know conscious about these questions it's going to be easier to deal with the everyday situations in schools thank you